Okay, good evening, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started tonight. Thank you again for being with us um, online for our living room lecture series. And um, we are very happy to have with us tonight, Dr. Frederick Vest presenting the forensic analysis of MOAI transport. My name is Stephanie Sandoval and I am the deputy director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. I um, have a few reminder of, reminders for some upcoming dates. Our annual barbecue, we are excited to hold it this year after a few years off, that's April 30th. Um, tickets are available on our website. And once again, if you haven't been, it's food and drinks and live music, silent auction, all of that good stuff. So hopefully for those local um, viewers tonight, you can join us on April 30th. Our next living room lecture is on April 7th, the original beach town, the San Diego, the city of San Diego's coastal heritage by Deirdre Encarnacion. Um, and then we have on July 31st is our application deadline for the Shetler Women in Archaeology Fund. So once again, information about all those events and programs, as well as visiting the center, center and membership options that can all be found on our website at sandiegoarchaeology.org. So tonight, again, we are using the Q&A feature, so you can go ahead and type those questions in at any time throughout the night, and then we will have a moderated Q&A at the end of the presentation. So I am very um, pleased to introduce Frederick Best. He holds a PhD from MIT and is a retired professor from Texas A&M University, where he taught design and engineering analysis for 29 years. He was also the director of the NASA Space Engineering Center at Texas A&M for 18 years. So for the last six years since retirement, he has turned his focus to the study of MOAI transport. Um, and he presented this research that he's sharing with us tonight um, back in 2018 at the Trans-Pacific Migration and Rapa Nui Conference on Easter Island. So without further ado, I'd love to turn it over to Fred. All right, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here this evening uh, to talk about a, a topic of uh, high interest to me. That's Te Pito O Te Henua. Uh, to those of us who don't speak Polynesian, that means the navel of the earth. For those of you who speak Dutch, Pasa Islanda, that means Isla de Pasco in Spanish, or Easter Island for those of us who are the English speakers. Rapa Nui is the uh, current common terminology for East Island, and it, it actually means big Rapa to distinguish it from small Rapa in the Gambia Island group. So whichever name you want to use, I'm going to try to introduce you to the mysteries of Easter Island, concentrating specifically on one area of specialty to me, the transport of Moai on the island. But what's a Moai? So let's mysteriously transport to the island of mystery, Rapa Nui, sunrise at Tongariki, the greatest assemblage of Moai on the island, 15 Moai, greeting the morning, bringing the sun up once again to the island. What's a Moai? Well, we're gonna study the Moai and talk about a forensic analysis of Moai transport. But first of all, where is the island? How big is the island? What's a Moai? What are they? How many are there? And where are they on the island? This map uh, shows North America, South America, and the triangle pointing to East Island. Easter Island is 2,100 miles west of the west coast of South America. It's a state of Chile, and it is uh, the most isolated, continuously inhabited island on the Earth. There are other places where people live, like Antarctica, but only Easter Island is continuously inhabited and habitable. Here's the island itself, and if my pointer works, and it does, so the island is 61 square miles. It is a, you can see the triangle here. It is about 15 miles across the long length and then seven miles across each of these lakes. It's actually composed of the joining of three volcanoes, one here, one here, and one here, and over millions of years, they have built up from the ocean floor to create the island of Rapa Nui. 
this evening, I'm going to be talking to you about the Moai, and the Moai predominantly originate from what's called a quarry on the island here at Rano Raraku, and we'll spend some time talking about that. You've already seen the 15 Moai of Tongariki, and I'll be visiting several other Moai Ahu, Ahu locations on the island. Let me just stop for a moment and go to Hangaroa, but talk about the, uh, the word, the terminology that I've used. So Moai is the word for the statues themselves. The altar on which they stand is called the Ahu. So in this picture here, we would say these are the Moai and the altar on which they stand is the Ahu. We are particularly concerned this evening with the transport of the Moai. How do the Moai get from here, Rana Raraku, over to here, Ahu Akivi, or over to here, Tahai, or Vinipau, or Vahu? How were they moved around the island for a people who only got to the island perhaps in the year 1000 and didn't have a high technological base? So that's going to be the main topic for me, but we have a couple other things to look at first. This is the photo of the town of Hangaroa. The population of the island, well, actually, I'm not certain of what it is now during COVID. It would normally be someplace between 3,500 and 5,000 people, uh, but I'm not sure how many have come and left, and I don't know if they have a census that tells what the population of the island is right at this time. Uh, they, a feature that I want you to see in this picture, besides the, the size of the town here, I want you to notice the rolling hills in the background. The island has almost no flat terrain. So whenever we're talking about moving Moai, we have to be talking about moving them up and down gradients of the hills of the island. And I talked about Rano Raraku. This is Rano Raraku. Look at from the position of Ahu Tangariki. And you can actually see the sunrise showing through the 15 statues. So we're gonna be looking in more detail at, at the quarry itself. This is probably the most iconic photo of the island. You've, you've all seen these pictures of what were talked about as the giant heads of East Island. Well, they were talked about as heads because that's what it looks like you can see in, this, in these photos. But in fact, there are full statues, and we'll see more of that, full statues all the way down, uh, about average of 30 feet tall. Here in the quarry of Ranararaku, there are about 40 statues, at least that have been known so far. Every time they dig in the quarry, dig among this detritus, they can come up with another statue. So I say about 40 at this time. And before we leave this slide, I want to show you, I want to call your attention to this region up here. These are places where statues have been carved out of the tuff. And I've used that word before, tuff, T-U-F-F. It is the compressed volcanic ash of this cinder cone. This is not lava, it's tuff. It's T-U-F-F, -F. it's a friable compressed ash, something that was relatively easy for the islanders to carve the statues from without having any metallic tools. There are statues both inside and outside the sink cone. By and large, they are all standing up here, but some of them are actually laying down. And I hope that your, your eye and brain become accustomed to picking out statues from the background. See the statue laying sort of upside down up over here, statue laying on its back over here. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be picking them out of the, the bushes and the trees. This is another shot. Now, the, the, thing, the reason I'm showing you this shot is not just to show you another area of the quarry where the statues are made, but to show you an important feature of these statues. I want to call your attention to the region of the eye, the eye socket. These statues and we'll see in comparison with others, other Moai, these statues have not had their eye sockets carved out and have the ability to have eyes installed. So these are primitive statues 
not yet completed to be moved out to their ahus. Now let's take a look at the, a statue that's in process. Now that you've seen a few statues, you can clearly see the head of the statue here, the uncarved eye socket, the nose, the lips, the chin, the neck, the body of the statue. I called your attention also to the carving out of the tough region so that the carvers could get around the whole statue to create it in place. By and large, the statues were created completely, oops, completely in place and then moved down to the region I'm going to show you next. I also want to call your attention to these inclusions. Remember I said this is volcanic tough, the material uh, shot out, not lava, but kind of a lighter cinder uh, that's shot out. These are inclusions of harder material in the Moai. Now, if this were, if anybody seen Mario, I'd ask you to identify the other Moai in this picture. And here it is laying right here. It's on its back. Here's the neck, here's the chin, the head up this way, and an arm coming around over here. The statues are, were carved actually in the tuff in the most favorable direction of the tuff as uh, decided by the, the carvers. Sometimes the statues are going left to right. Sometimes they'd be going up to down. Uh, it just depends on how the tuff has been layered down. If we look down from Ranaraku out along the plains, out away from the quarry, these are more statues. And again, you can pick them out in the field. They're buried out here. All these statues, the 40 in the quarry, are statues that are there standing, pending travel. And if you were to read more details about the uh, history of East Island, they would tell you that it seems like the statue work was stopped all at one time. And the, the period of statue carving ended with 40 statues here, but a thousand statues spread all over the island. And how did they get all over the island? I say again, how did they get 15 of these statues here to Tongariki? And this, let me reiterate, this is the Ahu, the altar on which the statues stand. These are the Moai. This is a pukau, commonly mistakenly called a, a top knot, but we'll, we'll call it a pukau for purposes of our presentation. Now, several things I want to call your attention about this. Notice that there, each statue is different. There's a lot of discussion. It's not known exactly what the statues are. It is thought that they represent a powerful chief, a powerful priest, uh, someone who is being deified, someone who is watching over and protecting the village, which is here in the foreground. In these statues now, in comparison with the ones back up at Ranararaku, I want to point out that the eye socket is much deeper, and we'll come back to that again later on. Also, while we're at this statue, I want to give you an idea of how big they are. So I'm not too tall, I'm actually about 5'7", but I'm standing at the back of the Tongariki Ahu, and you can see the statues towering up above me. That's just to give you an idea of the size of the statues. Now, let me say a, perhaps a disappointing feature of the Moai and the Ahu. No statue that you see standing on the island today is a statue that was standing on the basis of the original inhabitants. By 1880, the statues that had been carved on the island were all toppled. Uh, they were all put down. Uh, and the exact reason for that is not known. It thought that it might be clan wars, uh, it might be a loss of reduced resources leading to conflict among the tribes. But in any case, by 1880, there were none of these statues standing. The statues that you see today were raised as part of archeological projects to restore statues to some semblance of how they were in the past. 
This is a, another example of scale. So here's a poo cow. The poo cow, you'll see, is a, you notice it's a different color. It's actually carved from a red scoria uh, at a different quarry than Rana Rara Kuu. This is the quarry of Punapal. And it, the convenience here is that we think we know how these were moved. They were carved, turned on their side, and rolled to the appropriate place. No, not a big challenge there. And actually, not many people disagree with that. This is how you would see the statues if you were approaching Easter Island from the ocean. And this uh, actually lets us show several important things. First of all, it's not a foggy lens. This is the mist or the spray that's thrown up by the ocean. Almost all of the ahus, the altars, and moai are arranged to be facing inland so that they can look over and care over the village in which they are placed. And again, here are people for scale so that you can see uh, the size of the people versus the, the size of the Moai and the Ahu. This, this Ahu is very near the village of uh, Hangaroa. But this is how you would see the vast predominant number of uh, statues and Ahu on the island today. So we'll start over here. You can just see the front edge of the Ahu. And of course you can see the Moai here toppled here, here, out here. And actually there are, there's Moai behind this Ahu. This is the way the uh, Ahus look before they were restored. And this is the way uh, almost all of the Ahu Moais on the island are today. Uh, before leaving the Ahu Moai, idea, I want to point out just one interesting feature. On the right-hand side, this is a, a wall of an ahu, and it is original, one of the few original walls. It is very well put together mason-wise versus a reconstructed ahu. So these are modern workers who have piled up stones to make a pile of rocks that look like an ahu, but this is the stonework of the original masons creating an Ahu. And this is actually why many people thought that there were similarities between the stonework of Easter Island and the stonework of say the Mayans and the Incans because of this stone, fine stonework as it appears here. And that's not within my purview to discuss. I'll leave that for other, other scholars of Easter Island, or I should say scholars of Easter Island to describe. I mentioned the unusual ahu of ahu akivi. This is the ahu of the seven navigators. Now, as in most things on East Island, there are uh, various thoughts, stories, tales that go with this. The, the one that has currency today is sort of an oral tradition, one that says these statues, these moai represent the seven navigators who left somewhere uh, in the Gambia island chain, Mangareva perhaps, and found the island of Rapa Nui for the chief to be Hotumatua. So they, they are the explorers. That is sort of supported by the fact that this Ahu is inland and actually looks out to sea potentially in the direction of Mangareva, or at least towards the uh, supposed island from which the East Islanders came. So, uh, before we leave this slide, I want to call your attention to these repairs here. This is actually frequently what happened to the Moai. As they were toppled, they would break at the neck. Okay. So, all right. Ah. This gives me an opportunity to, to say that the Moai did not spring full blown 30 feet tall. The first Moai on the island were actually small. And you can see here a Moai that's about three feet tall. So uh, it, it gives the opportunity to say several things. One, they, they began small and grew, presumably in, a, in terms of a one-upmanship. My clan wants to have a bigger 
uh, Moai than yours. My village wants to have a bigger Moai. Uh, but also it says that not all the Moai needed the most advanced transportation techniques. You could move a Moai like this by tying it to some poles and carrying it along. Uh, also, uh, it's not dealing with the transportation aspect of the Moai, but in these Ahus, when they are reconstructed, it is frequently found that there are small, small Moai included in the Ahu. And it is thought that in order to maintain the mana, and I'll come back to that, the mana of the chief of that Moai, it is incorporated into the new and extended Moai. I said I'd come back to the niche, and this is a, a close-up of the head and top knot, the pukau, of a Moai at Tahai, uh, another Ahu location. And the eyes here are in these indented niche, niches of the Moai head. The Moai is thought to actually become alive, active as a spiritual being when the eyes are in place. They're not there all the time. The eyes are put in place uh, for uh, ceremonies, for uh, spiritual reasons. Uh, they, uh, the eyes themselves are composed of white coral carvings with a basalt pupil. Actually, these the eyes, this coral, uh, was only discovered in the uh, most recent decades when uh, ahus were being reconstructed and the coral was found. Well, now we're going to shift over to talk about the my actual specialty, the transport methods. I talked about the modes, the places where the statues had to be moved on the island, and that involves what are referred to as the Moai roads, and we'll look at some photos of Moai on the road, so to speak. I'll briefly go over the models that I created, engineering models, structural engineering models, the loads that I calculated for the models and compared the loads that were in the created in the models with the material property limits of what the statues are composed, the tough. I'll talk about the stability calculations. I already told you that some of the Moai are 30 feet tall. Well, if you're going to move them over and over on a hilly island, how do you keep them balanced? How do you, what are the limits on their stability? And then I'll briefly summarize the work, talk about future work because every researcher always has more work that they wanna do. And I'll briefly touch the references and importantly, the acknowledgements of the people on Easter Island who were a tremendous help to me. So what were the methods by which the Moai could have been moved? The islanders would tell you that the chiefs of the island used their mana, their power, to have the Moai walk from uh, the uh, Rana Raraku quarry to the Ahu. And uh, I have no way to evaluate that. It's part of their oral tradition. Things that I can evaluate, we know that the Rapa Nuans had maritime technologies of ropes, how to tension sails, how to lash beams together, how to tie things to fixed points, how to create and use beams, balance, and rollers. We've already seen that they were outstanding masonries, cutters, and polishers, all of the technologies available to create the Moai, but in a, uh, a primitive sense compared to what we have today. So what Seeing those Moai, archaeologists said, ah, I have an idea about how they were moved. And the archaeologists proposed at least five different methods by which the Moai could be moved on the island. Thor Heyerdahl in the 50s at his visit to the island and in his book Aku Aku said that the Moai could be moved by pulling them along on a sled or just on their back. And he actually demonstrated this by lashing a moai and collecting a group of 250 islanders to pull a moai on its back. And that's possible. And, and by the way, why would anybody be interested in, in how many people it takes to move a moai? Well, the uh, people, the archaeologists of the island are interested because that represents a resource requirement. Uh, how many people, how much food, how much effort does it take to move a statue around the island. 
Hunt and Lippo, together with uh, Pavel, proposed the what's called the refrigerator walk method. In this case, what you're seeing here is a group of islanders would pull the statue to one side. On the other side, another group would rotate that side forward. So the statue would alternately rotate, le rotate left and right, counterclockwise, clockwise, and be pulled left and right. Hunt and Lippo actually created a, uh, a model, a large model of a Moai made out of concrete and demonstrated the geometric capability of this working. Malloy proposed a kind of a, uh, an A-frame system where the Moai would be attached to beams and the beams would be rocked forward, pulling the Moai forward. Then the beam would be reset Moai would be stepped forward and stepped forward and stepped forward. This method was not demonstrated. Love proposed that the statues were moved by vertically placing them on a sledge and moving the sledge on rollers. To me, this, uh, this has the interesting uh, result of satisfying the oral tradition of saying, the statues walked. At least they are vertical and being moved around the island. Von Tilburg proposed a method of a sort of a combination of sledge where instead of just pulling it along, it was actually rolled on these rollers down here. And she considered the statue laying on its back and laying on its face. There are advantages structurally that she thought for each one of these. Uh, and she actually demonstrated this. It was a little complicated. The rollers got uh, crosswise on the beams, but it was possible to show that the statues could be moved in this method. Could they handle it structurally? She used a concrete model. Next, we're going to look at some of the moai along the roads. Uh, what, since I was interested in broken moai, I took photos of broken and unbroken moai along the roads. And to me, that is data for me to use in my calculations. So here's a moai. We're out in the field. We're not at Ranarara Ku, we're not at an Ahu. We're out along a trail uh, somewhere between Ranarara Ku and an Ahu. This particular moai is lying face down. You can see this is the body of the moai. Here's the head. In this case, it broke at the chin. Uh, here is the neck and the arms going down. For me, it was interesting to see where the moai broke uh, because it influenced the kind of model that I would make. Here's a model where now you can see you're getting to know what moais look like. Here's a moai. It's on its back. Here's the nose, the chin, the neck is right here. In this case, the moai actually broke a little bit below the neck, sort of uh, below the shoulder of the, uh, the moai. Another moai, this, is, this one is laying down on its face. Here's the break, the simple break. This is an interesting, a set of moai actually. So here's, this moai is on its back. Here are the arms, the head, here's the break. This, is, this moai is particularly interesting because it demonstrates that the tuff is inhomogeneous. It's not a uniform material. The crack started at one location and then bifurcated, broke into two. So. Also, uh, you can see another Moai in the back behind this one. These are out along what are called the Moai roads. So I actually have photos of many broken Moai out along the roads. And I, I use those to compare with the calculations that I did. And the calculations were for structural models of the Moai. I set up two, what I refer to as limit models a cylindrical moai where the diameter is equal to the base diameter of the moai, a cylindrical moai where the diameter is equal to the neck of a moai. I made both of them 
the height of about four meters with a base diameter of about 1.6 meters and a neck diameter of about 0.9 meters, weighing about 12.5 metric tons. This is the average Moai of the island as computed by uh, Von Tilburg in her summary of the, uh, the Moai on the island, the, the Moai project. I've shown down here a palm trunk diameter of about a quarter of a meter. You might think that's a, a, a pretty large diameter for a palm tree, but in fact, there are many clasts, many, many uh, inclusions of stumps of palm trees in lava flows demonstrating sizes equal to this and greater. So this is the, the base material out of which I have to do my structural calculations. Here's a moai, moai body, moai neck head. Here's one model, a cylinder with the diameter equal to the body of the moai. The second one is a cylinder equal to the neck diameter of the moai. Where will it break? Well, we've seen that it breaks at the neck, at the above the chin and down here in the shoulder. Here's a moai uh, in accordance with the von Tilburg method ready for transport. In this case, it's face down. The sledge is composed of palm trunks, transverse support palm trunks and palm trucks again, keeping it mounted on the sledge. So this would be pulled along on rollers. I will just briefly mention here, this is the structural model of the Moai. Imagine that the Moai is a ruler that you have in your hands, a typical wooden or plastic ruler. Uh, you're, you're flexing it at each end, producing a bend in the, in the ruler. And it's easy to imagine that the Bending in the ruler produces a maximum bend in the middle of the ruler, and the bend above and below a neutral axis means that the ruler top part is under compressive load and the bottom part is under tensile load. And I won't go through any of the equations here, but they're equations that allow us to trans translate the loading here, and this is called linear loading, loading of 3.2 metric tons per meter into an actual stress. Whoops, what happened to the screen? There we go. Uh, a distress, a compressive strength stress or a tensile stress. The stress has to be compared with what the material properties uh, of the, the tough will support. And here I was uh, very disappointed to find that there were essentially only one measurement of the mechanical properties of Rano Raraku Tuff. Uh, as an engineer, I thought that I could just go to a materials handbook, flip to the page on Tuff, and read the material property limits. Uh, not, not the case. There is one, has been one measurement, and I'll show you the reference later, uh, of the uniaxial compressive strength in megapascals. And to calibrate things, one megapascal is about 150 PSI. So Ranararaku Tuff has a range of strength of five to 15 megapascals. In comparison, the lava that you're more familiar with from a volcano, the black stone that you most often see has a compressive strength of 12 to 63 megapascals. So Basalt, the, the common lava stone that you're familiar with, is nominally very much stronger than Ranararaku Tuff. On the other hand, it's that strength making it so strong. That's why the uh, Rapa Nuans chose to carve out of Tuff. It's a much more friable, a softer material, especially when it's wet. So uh, in comparison, then, I should say also, if you wanted to compared with modern structural material, concrete is stronger, is in the range of uh, basalt and could actually be stronger than basalt, about 20 megapascals. Coconut palms, the wood 
uh, of, of the island has a compressive strength of 13 megapascals. So when you put all that together, when you put the calculated stress in comparison with the allowed stress of the material, that's what this table shows. So here's a maximum stress in the, for the neck model of the MOI. That's the small neck model of the MOI. It has a calculated maximum stress of 0.88 megapascals. And for tough in that, in that stress, the tensile stress is only two megapascals. So this says that it's relatively close and probably within the, the range, the limits of, and the accuracy of the calculation, it's probably right on the limit of what that statue could be, how big it could be supported as it was. The maximum stress of the base model, that's where the, the whole body of the statue is used standing up is only three tenths of a megapascal with a compressive limit of five to 15. So we're far away from a failure limit there. As, as is good, this is good because it says that a statue standing up is not gonna collapse on itself. We have plenty of examples to show that doesn't happen. Then the palm trunks. So if we calculate the palm trunk stress for say the sledge model, where it, it is supporting crosswise, the uh, MOI, we find out that it's got a stress of 30 megapascals compared with a maximum stress of 13 megapascals. Well, that means that one trunk would fail, but the wily Rapanuans would just use as many trunks as were needed to support the, the statues. And I give them credit for three, four, six. So in, in answer to the stress across, they could be done. In compression, it was much easier the statue standing compressing on uh, coconut pumps only produced a, a stress limit of uh, 0.1 megapascals compared with 13. So no problem there. There were other limits that I mentioned earlier. There's the stability limit. You saw how the island is hilly. Well, here is the calculation of the static stability limit. This is the base of a MOI. The center of gravity is forward of in the base. And you saw that because you saw how the stomachs of the MOI protrude front to back, left to right. And just looking at this graphic here and now looking at tilting a statue, the statue will fall when the center of gravity exceeds or goes outside the footprint, the original footprint of the statue. When you do that on a front to back calculation, you get a tip maximum allowed tip of 14 degrees. If you do it on a side to side calculation, you get a maximum tip of 23 degrees. And that should be obvious, or at least the, the scale of these should be obvious that the front to back tip is much less. You can see it's a shorter distance here to here than from left to right. So that's, these actually set the limits of what a freestanding statue would be able to, to uh, sustain. Fortunately, we don't have to just depend on a freestanding statue. We can also tie a statue front, back, back, front, and left to right. Thor Heyerdahl showed that a statue could be raised, and he, he did it, and, it, and we'll see the demonstration shortly. But here's a statue in uh, Von Tilburg's mode or in Heyerdahl's mode. On its stomach, the center of gravity is here. You start to raise it up by levers, picking it up at the head end. And as soon as you tip the statue over to where some of it is now touching the ground, everything to the right of this plane is actually assisting you in raising the statue, bringing up the center of gravity. So that will happen automatically. Here is Thor Heyerdahl demonstrating that. It actually took this team of his two weeks inching the statue up, levering it up inch by inch, pulling it up, levering it up, and piling the stones. I can assure you also that stones are plentiful on Easter Island. So this is the higher goal demonstration. The Hunt and Lippo demonstration, the refrigerator walk, that 
I'm showing sort of characteristically here. Here's a moai body here. Oops, my cursor's moai body here. And if it's refrigerator walked, I would think that there would be wear regions wearing off these edges of the statue. However, when I photographed multiple statues on the island, except for some breakage on the, on the edges, they all looked essentially flat. So I don't see what I would expect to see as the wear pattern. When Hunt and Lippo did their tests, they, they used a steel reinforced concrete model, which are nowhere also. Pretty flat down there. I don't see anything that would be characteristic of the wear model. Again, flat, flat. So uh, having considered the structural calculations, looking at the data of where the statues broke, the base of the statues, my preliminary work summary is that for Thor hired old's horizontal sledge method that it satisfies the stress calculations and would work. Malloy's method I really couldn't uh, address because it turns out that there were no properties for the impact uh, strength of the tough. So I couldn't evaluate dynamic loading. And I'll just say that as far as I know, Malloy's method has not been tested. Hunt and Lippo and Pavel both did tests of the refrigerator walk as far as I can find, there were no erosion wear patterns on the statue. They do have to satisfy and can satisfy with care the stability limits. Love statue, a moved in the vertical position, satisfies the stress limits, has to satisfy the st stability limits. And I'll just briefly return to the fact that it also satisfies the oral tradition of the fact that the islanders say the statues walked. Von Tilburg's method of sledge and rollers marginally satisfies the stress calculation, particularly the tensile stress calculation. And uh, what I need to do is have more information about the limits of the tough. So for my future work, what I'm proposing is analyzing the largest moai that was ever moved and erected on an ahu, a Riki Paro, a statue that was 9.6 meters tall and weigh 84 tons. I'd like to have property measurements that would allow me to evaluate the dynamic loading. I need the impact strength of Rana Raraku tough. I need to have stress limit statistics. That means more than just one measurement of the stress characteristics. I need the relationship between stress and strain. And of course, I need to go back to the island and look for more erosion and wear data. And also, uh, I'd like to obtain a, a software package that would allow me to do finite element analysis. This is advanced stress modeling that would allow me to, instead of using cylindrical MOA, it would allow me to model the MOA as heads, necks, and body to do advanced stress modeling. So that's, every researcher always has more work that they want to do, and that's mine. i just like to, acknowledge the a tremendous work that I received from uh, Sergio, and in particular, Edmundo Edwards, the lead archeologist researcher on the island, uh, of, who was my mentor in carrying out research, getting research approved, and is working even now on the island every day throughout the pandemic to get more work done. If you get a chance, you should look up his planetarium and support it if you possibly can. And then Pecos Rio Roroco, uh, my field guide on the island, uh, taking me across the island through brambles and bushes and uh, warding off uh, unhappy owners who were not pleased with me tromping across their land. I do have some references if anybody's interested in them. If you want a comprehensive understanding of Rapa Nui, I'd recommend Edmundo's book, When the Universe Was an Island. And last but not least, we finish up with the sunset in Hangaroa. And now, uh, if anybody is still awake, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Fred. My name is Dante Ferenga, and I'm the Development and Marketing Director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. I'll be moderating the Q&A portion of tonight's discussion. Just as a reminder, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom control panel, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. We have a question about how would the eyes adhere to the moai? How, how do they adhere to the moai? Mm -hmm. All right, let me go back. Now that you've seen both the moai with and without the eyes in them, this particular uh, Moai is a modern one, and it's just got cement that's holding it in. But we have to realize that the islanders were masters of all the materials on the island, include, including the gums of trees and uh, other sticky materials on the island. I don't believe that there is a modern answer for that. I don't think that a elemental analysis of uh, material adhering to the coral, the coral of the eyes has been determined yet. It, as I said, it's only within the, I think within the past 10 years that the coral eyes were actually discovered. But I, it, just as a visitor to the island, I can see many different materials that could be used to cement them in place temporarily because they were taken out after the ceremonies. As I said, normally the statues would be standing looking over the village without their eyes. Do all the Moai have insets for attachable eyes? Do they have what? Do they all have that sort of inset, that indentation for the attachable eyes? Oh, great question. The answer is only the Moai that have gotten to the Ahus have the uh, incise. You can see here this deep indentation in the heads of the moai. That indicates that the carving has been done such that the eyes could be implanted. If we look at the moai in the quarry, you can see it's not nearly as indented yet. So only the ones that have been brought out to their uh, ahu and raised uh, have the deep incised locations. There's some some spot here, but it's not really done until they have been raised on the uh, on their ahu. And where and how were the coral eyes found? Ah, wow. Uh, the only part that uh, that I know uh, about the coral eyes was that they were found in a re in working on a reconstruction of an ahu. And when they were originally found, they were in pieces and were not, it wasn't recognized that they were eyes from the statute. They were uh, kept for years, I believe, in the Moai Museum, excuse me, the Malloy Museum on Easter Island until somebody recognized them as the possibility for eyes. And then they, it was seen that they would fit in the niche. I don't remember which Ahu restoration uh, it was, that, or which excavation it was that they were found in. And why is the tuff easier to carve when wet? That's just the property of the material itself. Uh, it's, it's, I'm trying to think of uh, examples. Uh, I guess you would say that since this, the tough material here is actually ash, individual particles of ash that have been uh, compressed somewhat into the tough. If you, as a hydrologist, if I imagine the water in among the particles, I can imagine that that would act as a lubricant, allowing the particles to be scraped. If you, if you actually go up into the quarry and get close enough, you can see individual scrapings uh, that were done. The, the tool that was used to do this is called a tokai, T-O-K-I, and it's like a hand chisel. And you can see individual, individual chisel marks. It's sort of like 
scraping uh, wet plaster. Could the wear have been repaired by the original makers? What about repairs? I want to, uh, someone asked if the wear, like any, if any of the wear patterns could have been replaced by the original makers. Oh, you mean the wear, the wear patterns? Uh, let me ask, uh, you're talking about the wear patterns at the base of the statue? I believe so, not quite sure. Okay, well, I, I, that's an excellent question because in addition to the statues that are along the Moai trails, uh, and which I were was easy easy to uh, photograph. I also photographed. Let's see. Hmm. No, I'm looking for. No, hold on. I also photographed the statues that are standing on their ahus, like these, to see if there was a. Uh, a wear pattern, and actually the things that are, are this lighter region here is where the statues actually fractured when they were tipped over. I didn't mention it, but uh, all of the statues were tipped over, and in this case, they were actually rolled uh, by a tsunami that washed up uh, on this part of the island due to a, uh, an earthquake in Chile. So you can see here that the bottoms are flat. I would say that uh, Hunt and Lippo don't agree with that. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping to meet them and see their uh, concrete model someday. Anything else? Yeah, we still have a few more questions. Uh, did the use of coconut rollers deplete the coconut groves to the detriment of a human population? Wow, this is a, a highly contested question about the island. Uh, in, in Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, he uses the uh, depletion, the cutting down of the palm trees on the island as an example of societal collapse but most of the archeologists, cultural anthropologists that I know don't agree with that opinion. Uh, it's definite that the island had to have its palm trees cleared in order to have fields to plant uh, food products. Uh, so that's one aspect of the trees being cut down. A, a, another researcher has found uh, gnaw marks, gnaw, G-N-A-W, on the palm tree nuts. And those are the gnaw marks of rats that were brought to the island by the Rapa Nuans. Not as a, a negative, but it's thought that as a food product, a protein resource. However, the rats multiplied on the island and some researchers would say that they ruined the seed nuts. The answer is it's not known how the island came to be totally depleted of a palm that is unique to the island. Have you looked at the failure modes of a broken moai abandoned while being moved to see if they support one or more of the movement method theories? Yes, uh, I in the simple modeling that I have done, it, it is either broken under compressive or tensile load. What I would like to do is to use the finite element stress modeling software that will allow me to model the MOI more correctly as a head, a neck, and a body uh, to allow me to uh, analyze more accurately what the MOI is. I must say, however, that from the examples of photographs that I showed you, you can see that the tough material is not homogeneous. So any statue might have an inclusion or a weak point along a given plane that would cause it to fail. So the, the answer is, if you want to know how a statue would fail, I would think that you would have to do something like computed tomography to find out what the internal homogeneity of the statue is before you could do a 
a stress calculation based on assuming that it's homogeneous. It's a, it's a tough problem. And could, could more than one movement method have been tried and used? Absolutely. Excellent question. Uh, I feel certain that more than one movement method would have been used. And as a matter of fact, I'm not gonna tell you exactly how I think it works because that's, the, that's what my next paper is for the next conference. But yes, absolutely. I think at least two or three different methods would have been moved, would have been used to move a statue from the quarry at Ranararaku to mounting it on an ahu. So then I will skip the question about which of the methods you think um, you think it was most likely since that will be in future research. Well, I, I would say that the likely method scales with the statue itself. You saw the small statue that was only three feet tall. You can move a statue like that with one uh, beam uh, carried between two or four guys. So it would just be lashed to a beam and carried. That would be a method that's not even shown here. Uh, on the other hand, the biggest statues would have to be uh, supported on a probably on a sledge because to, to quote, quote a new phrase, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. So it would be it would be better for stability purposes for the largest statues if they were horizontal. So you take a spectrum from small to big. And I'd like to share a few of the comments. Someone said that Hunt and Lippo wrote a very readable book, The Statues Walked. Right. And also, so we have a comment that Pavel's method also satisfies the oral tradition of walking. Uh, Hunt and Lippo and Pavel both together satisfy the tradition of walking. That's correct. Absolutely correct. And I'm just curious, what led you to conduct this research? How did you get interested in studying this? Oh, uh, this group is asking such great questions. I can tell you specifically, in 1957, I found Thor Heyerdahl's book, Aku Aku, in the library. Uh, I was 10 years old, and I read it, and I wanted to go to East Island from that time on. When I finally got to East Island and learned more about the island and all the different aspects of the island, and as I said, I recommend Edmundo Edwards' book, When the Universe Was an Island. When I finally got to the island and then read about the various methods that are proposed for moving the statues and, had, and saw no calculations of whether any of that would work and found out that people who had simulated the statues using reinforced concrete which is much stronger than any tough statue. I said, maybe, maybe as a retiree in my aged condition, I could use, I could do some calculations to support this, and it would get me out to East Island as well. It was a break from tradition for me because as a professor, I was just used to having a graduate student do a calculation for me. And the size of the statues seem comparable to the pylons at Stonehenge. Any cross study? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this group has asked such wonderful questions. So the, the stones at Stonehenge, the blue stones, the ones at the interior, are about uh, 10 to 15 ton a piece. And the bigger standing stones are about 30 tons. And they they are uh, of similar mass and scale to the, uh, the Moai of East Island. However, the stones of stone, and let me just say parenthetically, I have, as, a, as part of my interest in these large structures, I have visited Stonehenge. I have visited Machu Picchu. I have visited Nan Madal. All of the places where big pieces of stone have been moved around uh, in pursuit of humans interest. And uh, I think the comparison, I, I, I don't, um, of course, you realize that the, the stones, all of the stones uh, at Stonehenge, except for some smaller, very small carvings on them, <coughs> 
and the the lintel stones at the top with the little pivot notches uh, they're pretty smooth they don't they don't have much information about structure on them so i'm not sure what comparative studies would be just thinking about what those stones and what the stones are at stonehenge and their size they would be uh, uh, structurally much more sound than the tough statues of East Island, T-U-F-F. -F. All right, what year was the tsunami and did all the Moai lay horizontal for years? Uh, hold on, I will give you the, the date of the tsunami. And they did lay, not just horizontal, they lay broken up for years. Let's see here. I don't have that one at the top of my head. While I'm, while I'm looking that up, I will just say that everybody should go to East Island when you can get to East Island and visit the statues, visit the museum. Okay. Uh, the tsunami was in May, 1960. And what did they, I'm just curious, what did they use to repair the Moai? Uh, as far as I can tell, and uh, Edmundo Edwards is working with me on this. If I go to, let me go ahead to the Ahu Akivi statues, these guys. So you can see here that collar. I am told by Edmundo that cylindrical borings were made in the head and in the body and steel rods were placed in the head and in the body and this concrete mixture poured in. I don't, and that's about all I know. I don't know what particular kind of concrete it was or uh, any special provisions that were made. And are there any that weren't broken? Yes, yes, there are. There are many statues on the island that were not broken. Uh, do you mean? Do you mean just broken from the tsunami, or in general? Um, I'm not sure. If someone follows up, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. So, uh, not all of the statues in Tongariki were broken. Uh, in general, they want to know in general. Oh, okay. No, like for instance, here, here, the, here's a statue uh, on an on an ahu. It's been toppled, but it's not broken. Um, the statistics that I would say for the mahu mahu the, the moai on the roads, I would say maybe. No, I don't want to be. I don't want to make it unsubstantiated call. There are many Moai that are not broken. Tip, so we, tip. Oh, sorry, go ahead. There are many Moai that are fallen. And, and after all, the Moai at Ranararaku have never been moved. And all of these are essentially whole. We have time for a few more questions. So if anyone has any further questions, make sure to drop them in the Q&A. Have you seen the temples at Malta? At Malta? Mm -hmm. No, I haven't been to Malta, uh, but I have seen uh, stone carvings into mountains as for instance at Petra, where the carvings are done into the mountain rock. Uh, at Petra, that stone is harder than the tough of Easter Island, but but softer than basalts, at least in my experience. And when do you plan to return to Rapa Nui? The day that the plane flights begin again. All right, I think that's all of our questions. Thank you again, Fred, for tonight's talk. And thank you to everyone for attending tonight's living room lecture. Our lecture series continues in April with the original Beach Town, the city of San Diego's cultural heritage by Deirdre Encarnacion. For more information on this and our other upcoming events, please visit our website at sandiegoarchaeology.org. Thank you and good night.
And I just say thank you all to having hang, hung in there for the lecture and q and A. I I really appreciate your participation. And get out to Rapa Nui. Thank you. <laughs>